Hello everyone, uh, this is a re-recording of the talk I gave in SIGGRAPH Asia 2019 over in Brisbane. Uh, so if any of you didn't get to watch the talk, I'm going to share some of the advancements in water and procedural technology going on at uh, Ubisoft Singapore. So we'll get started. Uh, first a little introduction by me, uh, Chris Kirkpatrick. I've been a technical artist for 15 years. And for those that don't know what a technical artist is, um, don't worry, one of the things technical artists do is explain what we do. So basically a technical artist is um, a developer that has um, the skills in both art and technical sides of game development. We act as the bridge between both of these realms. Um, we can basically speak both languages, so we support the artists, making sure that they're happy, they have pipelines and tools, and uh, other data is validated. And on the programmer side, we can uh, uh, support them by understanding the technical constraints and what the artists need and, and support future work and stuff like that. So basically, we kind of connect these sides and support both as needed. So I've actually been at Ubisoft Singapore for eight years. Um, anyone who knows the games I've worked on um, listed here will recognize um, a common theme is that they all have uh, ocean, water, or naval experiences in them. So I was um, privileged enough to be part of uh, water development on uh, many projects. Currently, I am the lead of the Tech Art World Team, um, where I'm working with five very talented guys and gals handling all the world topics on Skull and Bones. Uh, the world is a lot of things. It's the ocean, it's weather, it's ambience, it's vegetation, it's terrain. It's a lot of stuff, um, but we all work together and, and, and share. So um, let's talk about some of the things we're going to cover right now. Um, we're going to start with the history of water. Then I'm going to talk about how um, water has evolved over the many years at our studio and over the projects. And then I'm going to share a few of our procedural tools with terrain and ship production. <coughs> So first step, the history of water. So with our studio, um, uh, water and naval experience is something that we hold uh, very dear to our hearts. Um, we are very proud of it. We feel it's core, sort of our, our identity. Our studio has not been involved in many naval experiences across as many amazing titles, and we're all very proud. So I'm thrilled to be able to share um, a bit of that journey right now. So let's we'll start with where it all began with Assassin's Creed 3. So this is actually the beginning of the naval experience for the Assassin's Creed series and for our studio. Um, it originally started as a uh, series of self-contained um, uh, linear missions where you're locked to the ship, but it really was um, agreed that it was something kind of innovative and fresh um, to the series and it really resonated with a lot of people. So when we went to um, collaborate on the next game in the series. It was clear that we really need to um, expand on this amazing thing that we had. Um, so now Singapore was um, uh, part of the task of making a huge open world, the entire Caribbean Ocean, where the player was free to explore, untethered from his ship, go where he wants, go where he pleases, and we really um, push the experience forward. And we went to Assassin's Creed Rogue, uh, again, we need to make sure that we leverage um, this amazing thing that we have with Naval. So how can we utilize what we've done and still provide something fresh to the player? So we uh, went to a new exotic location in the North Atlantic, and that brought with it the winter setting and a lot of uh, the new Naval ice ingredients like the icebreaker rim uh, you're seeing here. And then Syndicate, this is where we took a bit of a shift, turning point, if you will. Um, not only was it on the current gen platforms on the Xbox One and the PS4, but we shifted over to uh, a river. So now we needed new technology to support the requirements uh, the river has over ocean, which is flow and, and um, uh, all the micro details and the, the, the muddiness uh, visuals. Uh, so we built a new river tech to support this and um, bring the Thames River to life. Next up is Assassin's Creed Origins. Absolutely visually stunning game. Um, what better way to evolve the river than with one of the greatest rivers in the world, the Nile. Um, so this is where the visuals and the rendering took in a huge boost um, when we made the shift over to physically based render to really, really render um, uh, amazingly believable water. And I'll explain a bit more on exactly what we did later on. 
Sussex Beat Odyssey um, on the same uh, vein, similar vein as Black Flag. Uh, once again, there is a huge open naval world to explore with the Greek islands. Sail where you want um, um, and explore at your whim. And of course, the, uh, the show waves uh, look phenomenal. And that brings us to present day where we are currently working on an open world of AAA Skull and Bones pirate game, which is led right here at our Ubisoft Singapore studio. Uh, so of course it goes without saying, we want to make sure that we have the best water and naval experiences uh, that players can find. And I have a little video to show um, how our uh, water technology has evolved. All right, so now I'm going to um, dive a little bit deeper into um, some of the individual features um, and aspects of water and how they've, um, focusing on how they've uh, changed and evolved over the years. Um, it's not a total super deep technical dive as maybe some of you may hope, but um, we want to focus on how we've improved uh, and, and advanced over the years. So I'm going to start with some of the dynamic stuff. All right, so how do we actually simulate our ocean? We use the fast Fourier transform algorithm. Don't worry about understanding exactly what that means or thinking about math formulas and stuff like that. But basically, it's just an algorithm that uh, that has different frequencies um, uh, over time. So by layering these different frequencies uh, of waves together, um, we can create an ocean. So uh, on on the right, um, there's four animated GIFs here. Uh, I'm actually isolating each individual layer of the FFT, so FFT 1, 2, and 3, and 4. Uh, you can see that there's a really low frequency big waves, there's two with medium waves, and one with high frequency small waves. When you layer them together, essentially putting it very simply, that's how we get uh, a believable uh, simulation. To show how we've uh, advanced that, back on AC3, we only had the two FFT layers, so we had a high frequency and a low frequency. On AC4, we added one more. Uh, higher high frequency FFT, but it had a visual only. Visual only meaning um, those waves um, didn't affect the physics of the ship. 
And then if we look at where we are now, um, we have four uh, FFT layers, all of which can have physics impact. And technically we have a fifth where we take the fourth and we do a, a scale on it to add in even higher frequency waves, which actually don't have um, uh, physics impact. We don't rely on that too much. And we have a higher resolution and we switch to GPU calculation. So you can just see in this GIF, GIF, sorry. In this one, we are, I'm just layering one at a time. So you can see once everything comes together, you have something that resembles uh, an ocean simulation. So for the river, we use the fractal running motion. And again, don't worry about the actual algorithm, but what matters is that we're using multiple layers of increasing frequency uh, uh, textures to drive the uh, motion. So you can see um, those are the actual textures um, that we use to drive the motion. And it, it, it does really excel at getting really higher micro detail um, uh, surface uh, deformation that um, a river really needs. Whereas a, an ocean simulation, you want um, bigger waves. So uh, two texts with their strengths and weaknesses um, for two different um, situations in game. Uh, real quick on some of the setup, yeah, we use a quad tree. Um, basically, this just allows us to uh, dynamically tessellate the mesh based on distance from the camera. So, of course, you get all the polygons um, where you need them, and you can save where you don't. Pretty straightforward. Uh, one of the optimization we did was rather than storing the ocean, uh, ocean node data for the entire giant world, which doesn't make sense because you're, you're not even simulating ocean uh, anywhere but around the player. We actually stripped that out and now we have um, the real ocean um, following the player uh, around and everything outside of that is just a simple mesh with some basic uh, ocean rendering. Okay, so now, now we understand the, the, the base layer of uh, the ocean setup, it's the FFT. Once you set up each FFT with their, um, their frequencies and their amplitudes, um, not, not necessarily amplitude, but you set up the frequency, the speed, um, and uh, the, the, sky, the size and everything. Each FFT setup, that's the base layer. But there's another layer where we can manipulate a few things um, and store them we, um, to access at runtime. We call them Beaufort keys. They're not actually following the Beaufort scale um, that you may have heard of, which um, uses wind speed to define um, ocean uh, waves. But it's just terminology we use to uh, define states that we can record. So we can record amplitude and the, sh the wave shift and various foam controls. And basically, these are ways for us to um, capture um, different states of the ocean. So it can be the calm water, it can be uh, um, um, some high wind areas, it can be a rough sea, it can be a storm, a crazy storm. These are whatever we define um, states of the ocean that we can then based on world factors like weather or ambience, we can access at runtime. So each one should be somewhat distinct so that the player can kind of recognize that the ocean is changing with the environment and, and it kind of feels like one connected world. So I have a video here that shows um, the Beaufort scale uh, increasing seamlessly. So yeah, it's pretty cool. We're really limited only by what the designers and, and, and the game directors want to show. It's hard to tell there, but in the Beaufort 12, those waves are pretty much 20 meters high, which uh, I think breaks every recorded wave record. Uh, so we can really do um, whatever crazy thing we want the ocean to do, which is pretty cool. All right, so I'll talk a bit about um, some of these uh, static um, textures that we use to drive um, or control world-driven data for the ocean. Shoreline, shore waves, uh, wave height dampening, some rough water patches, and the actual water colors. So, 
the full map are pretty straightforward. It basically checks for where there's land and where the water meets the land and then add a foam line around it. Um, we also store the vector information for the uh, procedurally generated shore waves. Um, the before dampening, so this is actually our way of um, re reducing the wave amplitude towards the shore so that things behave correctly. If we didn't do this, you could have high waves uh, near shallow terrain and you get weird clipping. And so basically just to make things all kosher and make sense. Um, you can see there we have everything color-coded so um, we can see wherever, where each Beaufort um, is and, and give each Beaufort enough time to appropriately dive in towards the shoreline. Um, one of the improvements we made was um, in the older method we had one map per world. Um, if you imagine a 16k world um, with one map, um, it needs to be pretty big. Uh, so you could have an 8k map for that entire world and still get horrible precision. Um, so it's not ideal. Um, and also the generation times, if I want to generate one small part of the world, well, sorry, you can't. The whole texture needs to be generated. So now we, we, we actually have the topology textures broken up onto the terrain patches themselves. So then you only need to load however many cells um, are on the player as part of your streaming. Um, so it allows us to basically use the same amount of memory but get about double the precision. And I can then generate on a patch basis rather than the entire uh, world. Quite an optimization uh, for workflow and performance. Um, this one is pretty straightforward, our rough seas map. These are static place zones that designers have free control to have higher before. One example could be a, a high wind channel or maybe even the Bermuda Triangle is always uh, high before whatever we want. We one extra layer of control for variety for the uh, designers to use. So we also store the watercolor um, in a static map. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by concentrations a little later. Uh, basically, this is where we define the colors for all the shallow refracted regions of the world. Um, we've also optimized a bit the workflow. Um, the way we used to do it would be uh, using one of the editors to draw vector maps um, and then assign a previously defined water type to that and then bake the texture. Working 2D to 3D separate from the, the terrain system uh, isn't ideal, so now you can actually paint water types directly onto the terrain and then bake that patch. So that's a little easier for artists to handle. Shore waves. Um, on the left you can see the, one of the older uh, iterations we had, which is very two-dimensional, uh, scrolling, highlighted wave. Kind of works for long ranges, but doesn't hold up up close. And now what we have is the uh, actual performing waves procedurally generated around the world. Uh, physics, so uh, we have, our boats have all the uh, hydrodynamic forces you would expect them to have, buoyancy, viscosity, drag, center of mass. Um, but what's cool is that um, each boat, of course, has its own uh, set of parameters um, for these, so you could have different sizes of boats uh, feeling different. So these are two different size, sizes here, medium sized ship and a big one. You'd expect the medium ship to uh, feel more of the waves because it's got it's not as big, it's got, not, got less mass, and the bigger ships should just plow through all the waves. So um, imagine if you had an even smaller ship, uh, even the smallest wave could be dangerous. So we want to make sure that the player feels the difference with his ship. Um, we are working uh, quite extensively on um, making sure that physics are as awesome as they can be and we're doing a lot of advance advancements but can't show anything right now sadly. Um, but one thing I can talk about is the inclusion and importance of wind, uh, go figure, sailing game wind. But this will be the first time for a naval experience where the wind has a direct impact on uh, your sailing experience. You can see here on the left, um, the ship is entering what we call in irons, which means you're going directly against the wind. There's a huge force and a huge splash, and um, uh, you lose your speed. So basically, uh, the player needs to understand how the ship handles, understands the wind, and of course, the ocean will take a, uh, uh, come into play as well on the sailing experience. So we're really pushing this as far forward as we can. Alright, so that's a bit about how, how everything moves and is controlled. Now we get into more of the pretty stuff uh, on what makes our 
water, uh, so beautiful. We'll talk about some rendering features. And we're gonna start with uh, Ocean Cut. So, <clears throat> um, back on AC3, uh, it was shaded with the traditional model. Um, you choose a color for the opaque, for the transparent, refracted, SSS, and basically apply that based on the opacity. Uh, so the shallow water would have one color, deep color would have another, etc. It works, yeah, um, but uh, it's definitely not uh, realistic by any means. It's prone to human error. Back then we had one type of water, it was Caribbean Ocean all the way. And now that we support huge worlds with multiple biomes and, and all the different ecosystems and, and diversity that they require, uh, something not going to cut it. Plus. The whole industry basically is going with physically based rendering, so of course the water needs to follow suit. So we're going to understand how this works with a little bit of uh, a physics lesson with optics. Um, have no fear, if I can understand it, I guarantee you can too. So watercolor obviously isn't just a matter of choosing a color. To understand what gives uh, water its color, we need to know what's happening with light with it. So we need to know how the light is interacting with the water. We need to know what's in that water that the light is interacting with, and we need to know what is being directly reflected off the water. These three things are very important. So if we take these three things and we boil them into some parameters that we can control um, uh, with, our, with our rendering, um, we have reflectance. So this is the red, green, blue levels of light that's bounced directly off the water into your eye. The absorption, which is the red, green, blue levels of light that is absorbed and taken away into the water and then scattering, which is the red, green, blue lights, uh, levels of lights that is diffused or scattered in different directions um, based on what is actually in the water, which, which will lead us to concentrations in a minute. So to understand absorption, uh, I have this amazing uh, video here that shows exactly what happens to light the deeper you go. Um, that's why you look at uh, a glass of water is clear and then you look at the, the, uh, the, bath, the, the bathtub or pool, you can see there's blue in there because at greater depths, the only color that really remains is the shades of blue. You can see that the reds and yellows and then even the greens start to uh, be absorbed um, into, the, into the water, leaving behind the blue. All right, so now we have absorption, scattering, and reflectance, right? But we need to apply that to the ocean in some way so that it's uh, believable. And the way we do that is we have three depths we apply that to. So obviously you have zero water, water meets shoreline, the, the shallowest point, then maybe between three or five meters you have another, and then you have infinite depth. So on the, on the right image I've colored it so that you can see red is the first point, green is the second, and uh, bright blue is the third. So basically now it's just a matter of um, controlling the red, green, blue colors of light. Um, at each of these depths. So at the most shallow, you want to absorb most of the light. You're leaving behind a very transparent, like this is the glass of water example. It's very clear. Um, the, at its most shallow, you don't see any color, um, unless there's something in the water, but we'll cover that in a second. And then after that, you start absorbing. All the red is gone, yellow is gone. Some green is left behind. Um, and then at the final depth, you get a very, very, very deep blue. So you can see, you get something convincing if you're looking at a very clear um, tropical type water. It's a, a natural progression for that. Um, but there, there is a problem. Uh, it's not the greatest workflow. Again, it's prone to human error. You're basically manually entering in uh, color values um, that either you're taking away or adding, which can be quite uh, confusing for anyone's mind. Uh, so with the new method, now we have a curve. So basically, you can get a, a mathematically correct progression on the uh, on your uh, scattering, absorption, and reflectance fall off. <clears throat> okay, so now we've got our base water set up. We know exactly what the light's doing. We know what's being absorbed. We know which colors are being scattered. We know which ones are being reflected. We're good to go. The only thing left we need to know is what's actually in the water for all these things to interact with. So that leads us to finally to the concentrations. So we have phytoplankton, which is the free-floating living organisms such as algae. If there's a lot of phytoplankton in the water, it'll be darker, greener, etc. Then there's sediment. This is the inorganic particulates in the water. High sediment um, will make things uh, opaque and murky. 
and then yellow matter. This is the decaying organic matter. Um, water with high yellow matter um, will absorb less of the uh, red and brown and, and, and more of the blue green um, and will appear more reddish brown. So that's it. Once you know, once you have your water behaving correctly with light, physically correct, and then you have, you know, what's in the water itself, then your output should be uh, correct. So now I have a series of examples where I took some reference from the real world and then recreated it in, uh, in Anvil with the skull and bones. So one of these images is, is real life and the other is in the game. Uh, I hope some of you have trouble telling which one because that means uh, it works. So yeah, an image on the right is um, from the skull and bones. So yeah, it's, this is the clearest water, bright blue. This is very little concentration at all, maybe a little bit of sediments tiny bit of phytoplankton, but this is as clear as you get. Turquoise, this maybe has a bit more phytoplankton in it, still quite clear. Uh, muddy water, high sedimentary, no transparency here. Even more that dark and sedimentary, maybe there's some uh, phytoplankton in here too. Then we go to like a swampy, this one still a little bit transparent, not a lot of sediment, but there's definitely some more uh, algae and uh, decaying matter in this one. And then a heavy swamp, this one's probably a little bit of everything. It's quite green and murky. So yeah, pretty diverse, um, which is good because we want to be able to support whatever type of world and whatever region we go, the water needs to match the vegetation that's there and the terrain, stuff like that. I have a video here that uh, shows how we can blend between these water types uh, seamlessly. around and some debris and then straight up into a mangrove swamp um, seamlessly. It's pretty cool. Very powerful system. Alright, uh, done with the watercolors onto uh, the surface normals. So on the left was one of our older iterations. Um, quite static, provided some noise, but um, we felt like where we are now we can um, improve that. So while uh, utilizing Houdini, which for those that don't know is um, basically industry Industry, industry standard um, or becoming industry standard uh, tool for um, generating procedural content. So we, so we just simulated an ocean mesh and um, extracted the normal, uh, frames of normal map from that and applied it to the ocean. So what it adds is another layer of very micro, uh, high detail surface that gives it another layer of uh, being alive. Um, so yeah, Previously, I mentioned uh, the Beaufort keys that we have. One of the parameters we can drive with the Beaufort keys is the actual uh, strength of the of the null map. So we can simulate the um, the natural occurring phenomena of a uh, high wind on the surface, um, creating roughness. Obviously, the higher the waves, you would assume higher the wind, and therefore you'd have a, a less calm surface. So we can we can mimic that foam. Foam is a, a, it's always a challenging one. Um, it's easy for foam to look static and, and for the placement to not be quite well. Um, it's, it's been tough to get to the awesome state that it is now. Um, basically, it's hard to make it not look so static and, and, and not realistic in its placement because it, it is technically a static thing. It's, it's another layer on the surface of the ocean that we, through various parameters like compression, height, stuff like that, we reveal. So it's still kind of tied to the movement of the ocean, which can make it feel computer generated. So 
now we've added, um, you can see on the left, that's the, one of the older um, examples of foam. The, the spread is not so realistic, um, it's kind of static. And on the right, um, closer to where we are now, um, you see much more realistic patches. You see the foam has wispy uh, kind of a feeling to it. it. It's not necessarily as connected to the surface as it used to be. We got some nice crest highlights on the waves, which give us better shape and just feels more natural and more alive. So kudos to the guys for that one. It's spectacular. Uh, for the sh for the foam on the river, um, we have a little bit of a different system. Two kinds of shoreline foam. Um, sorry, two, line, two, two kinds of river foam. We have the uh, the shoreline, which we've added a fake shadow and highlight to help it pop around the edges, and then the dissipating foam. Uh, on the left, you can actually see that we can uh, attenuate based on the water type. So if it's a, a muddy river, we can tint it a little bit brown just so it feels more integrated into the uh, type of water. Churn, this is an awesome feature that we use to uh, simulate the turbulence and motion that happens under the surface. So as water gets churned up, um, it, it, it injects oxygen and um, and uh, reacts with the subsurface scattering, which gives it this brighter blue look and makes it feel like there's depth to the surface. Combine that with some parallax, and we created the illusion that it's not just a flat, um, um, deforming mesh, and it has some life under it. It's pretty cool. For the river, um, we actually do some cool stuff where, um, on the very clear water, on the left example, you can see that behind the player, he's leaving, sort of kicking up. Um, kicking up the water and creating this churn under the surface. And on the murkier waters, you can actually cut through the, the sedimentary uh, objects and leave a trail. So it's pretty cool. A nice way to interact with the water. For a specular reflection, comparing AC4 with Origins, obviously they both look amazing. Um, the main difference with um, where we are now is we have two specular calculations, um, one for the main highlight and one for sort of like the rim or the, um, the fill just gives you a better spread for the sun reflection. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward, it's combining two results. So for the SSS translucency, um, so for those that don't know what subsurface scattering is, uh, imagine um, whenever you've seen a light behind someone's ears or their nose, basically you get, you get light scattering and, and diffusing in underneath your skin, picking up the blood vessels and getting this red highlight, so same thing when you have light passing through a wave, um, if it's translucent enough, you'll get, a, you'll get a scattered highlight. So we simulate that with both the river and the ocean. For the environment reflection, um, we use a combination of the uh, screen space local reflection and the QMAP. Basically, if, if the, the sky is not present, we use QMAP and kind of do a blend between uh, just to make sure that we fill in and everything for the environment and the sky. Uh, on to a couple of VFX topics now. Um, so we're looking at three examples of the bell splash and the ship wake from Black Flag, Origins, and uh, Skull and Bones currently. Obviously they all look great, but uh, it's nice to see how we've uh, improved. Obviously the particle effects have more depth and more shape and uh, the, the, the churn and the foam being left behind. Um, it's definitely same with underwater, uh, back on Black Flag, uh, we had underwater sections. Um, the main difference, I guess, is you couldn't do the, you couldn't swim underwater wherever you wanted. Um, they were set locations. Now with Origins uh, and Odyssey, you could uh, go underwater wherever you wanted. So that means we needed to render the ocean surface. We needed to have uh, light rays uh, passing through, and of course, we needed to make sure that every water type had an underwater uh, feel to it. So if I'm in a swamp or if I'm in mud, when I go underwater my visibility and the colors um, I see reflect that. Um, we have this pretty cool system, the Ocean World Particle System. So anyone who worked with effects knows it's a real pain to place instances all over the world only to find them that you need to, um, that part of the world has been changed and you need to redo your work. So not with the system. The system will read water types. So if you had a swampy water, we would know that that's where we need to place all of the uh, swampy, grungy you know, um, particles uh, in that area. Same with if we had a shipwreck, we could detect that and we could spawn fires and uh, wood debris and 
floating bodies or whatever. So what's great about this is if we change the water type, we move a whole island, we move a shipwreck, we can regenerate these um, VFX uh, instances um, without um, upsetting our poor artists. So it's pretty powerful. All right, I have a little um, showcase here from some of our effects wizards uh, in Singapore. Shout out to these guys. They really make all the work that we do on the water shine. It's spectacular stuff. All right, um, almost done with the water. I'm just gonna cover a couple um, things we have in the pipe. Um, we're always obviously looking for ways to advance things, and these are just a couple examples of what we're focusing on now. So I explained how river and ocean use the two different algorithms at 15 FPM, but previously they've been kept quite separate, either in separate games or separate worlds or within the same world but kind of uh, separated. Um, blending them is not the easiest thing to do but um, we're making great progress. Basically we want to be able to unlock um, designers and game directors to make make whatever world they want. Rivers flowing into oceans, uh, etc. Really, there's no limit if we can make this work so it's looking pretty good. It's definitely gonna get there. Um, this is a big one for me. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really important that the uh, the water feels like it's part of the same world as your other systems, whether that's the with the wind, the weather, the, the terrain. So the, we need to be able to have dangerous um, waves near cliffs and landforms and have them feel like they talk to each other. So yeah, we, we have some early work here, but we need to make sure that the system uh, obviously isn't a manual thing. It's procedural. We put a cliff in the water and we can get big splashes. So. It's something important that we're working on. Yeah, and as I mentioned, if the water interacts with the land and the wind needs to interact with the water, we need to feel waves breaking, we need to feel the spray, the mist, especially in a storm, we need that water being kicked up everywhere. So on the left is an example from an early iteration. We do have a GPU particle system, but it, it needs to be um, improved um, to satisfy what we want. So physics, again, I apologize, I can't show um, some in-game stuff. Uh, it's not ready to show yet, but um, we want, we really are focusing on making sure that the waves feel dangerous, that um, we need to pay attention to them. Um, maybe you can be capsized, you take damage. Um, we need to make sure that you feel like this giant ocean is uh, dangerous, as you should. 
and Storm. Again, I so wish that we could uh, show you some of the cool stuff we got going on in this one, but I promise it's going to blow your mind. Uh, so we're looking at, at EC3 and Black Flag here. Um, storms look wonderful, um, but uh, we really need to make sure that we're raising the bar in this one. Uh, the storm really is the is the end game. It's the culmination of all of the efforts we put on the ocean and, and rendering in general. It's it's when everything's cranked to eleven. You got high waves. You got high wind. There's rain. There's fog. There's clouds. There's low visibility. It's basically everything you're throwing at the game and stress testing the GPU, of course, but we want to make sure that this feels dangerous, like a real storm should, that you shouldn't go in a storm unprepared. So yeah, look forward to that. Hopefully even better than these examples. So that's it for water. We're gonna share a couple of the uh, procedural um, systems we have going on right now. With uh, terrain, first up, this is coming from one of my boys. Uh, shout out to Ren Chi on this one. He's been working very hard on um, coming up with a system that um, can do everything we need to do to build our general worlds, to make sure that artists have the controls they want. Uh, he's been doing a great job, so shout out to him. Um, before we get to what we've done, a uh, real brief history. Anyone who's worked with um, terrain or landform generation probably knows a few of these, but um, just to cover a bit of our journey. Um, so one easy way is with a, a height map. So by using a 2D image, we basically can um, gener uh, we can uh, generate the terrain topology that way. So yeah, it's fast. Um, you can work with brushes. Um, but on the bad side, um, artists working from 2D, 3D again, lots of back and forth through Photoshop, large file sizes. It's just it's not uh, it's not a scalable solution for what we need. Uh, and even worse for what we need is the probably the simplest solution using a procedural noise. Super fast, works, can get some convincing stuff, but and we got no artist control, so uh, that's not gonna work. Uh, in editor sculpting tools, uh, step in the right direction. Artists can paint um, directly into an editor. They can work with 3D, um, lots of detail control. But we were having issues with um, the scale of the world we're building and multiple artists working on one line form, just too many limitations. And the one thing that we need to have um, is the erosion. Uh, the erosion pass is when we simulate millions and millions of years of natural phenomenon on uh, terrain landforms. It's absolute must for anything that's convincing at all, um, but it's generally always expensive with long generation times. All right, so this leads us to what we need summary here. Uh, we need to uh, have the artists and designers with in-editor controls um, we need believable and consistent macro and micro scale. We need to make sure that everything looks good from far away and everything looks good from up close. It's a Ubisoft game, we will not compromise. And you can go anywhere and you can see anything, so it needs to be consistent. And we don't want any uh, third-party software. Let's go straight into the editor, Anvil Editor. Uh, so, that on that topic, um, we did experiment with Old Machine for a while. Um, we got some good results with the custom erosion templates and uh, it was quite promising but again we don't want the middleman back and forth. So what we did is we integrated Houdini directly into our Anvil editor and by utilizing a, a proxy mesh system to help alleviate um, the long generation times of cooking all this data, um, now they can preview their um, landforms um, for the um, composition and layout and get a general sense of things and, and, and generate a, a, a quick um, simulation of what it will look like without the long generation times. So they get a preview, a low resolution, and then from there they can submit that data, which will then um, um, produce the high resolution um, data from a distributed render farm. So it's pretty cool. So now that we have increased iteration by utilizing proxy meshes, remove that bottleneck of having to wait till the next day to um, bake our stuff. Um, no more third-party software integrated directly into our editor. And then this proxy mesh that the artists can control. So on the uh, GIF here, you can see artists can build entire villages or, or whatever piece of um, um, content they want, slot that into the terrain, and then terraform around it, rescatter the vegetation appropriately. Uh, so it's this pretty powerful um, instead of what it 
previously have been, so it's definitely an improvement. So one future advancement currently uh, Richie is working on is um, we want to be able to uh, <coughs> create the proxy meshes in the editor and modify and preview erosion before we even do it. So more in editor controls, more preview functionality, uh, better iteration times. Um, we also got a few guys who are focused on um, seeing where we can apply some machine learning, which is another um, popular uh, buzzword right now in the industry. Uh, here's one of the prototypes done where you can directly paint um, the, the land ridges, landform ridges and, and um, uh, sculpt quite fast uh, and get something pretty convincing. So this is just a prototype, we're not really sure uh, where to go from here, but it, it's definitely uh, impressive. And then the erosion. As I mentioned, there's a huge cost to doing an erosion. It can take hours, but with um, some training between six hours and four days, we can get a result in 13 milliseconds, which is kind of fast, pretty fast, pretty fast. And uh, the results are very promising in this one. So uh, shout out to those guys over there, um, Chetty and, 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 the, and the machine learning dudes for um, exploring this one. Very cool stuff. All right, on to the last one, procedure ship production. Uh, so yeah, we're making a we're making a pirate game. Uh, we need ships, and we need them to be unique and have multiple sizes and be super high detailed. Um, we we can put the camera behind the captain. We can put it behind the crew. We can put it behind the the weapons all around the deck. Everything needs to be high detailed, high resolution, and we need to make sure that we have high pressure velo velocity on this if we need to. Um, release more ships um, as we go. We want to make sure they're not going to take ages to create. So the problem with the traditional uh, ship production method that we were using is that it's a ton of hand manual work. Um, but worst of all, it's a very restrictive linear pipeline. Um, meaning if we finish a ship and realize, oh, we don't like this one aspect of it, um, that might mean we redo everything that came before and have to re-rake and, and skin um, a lot of stuff. It's just not really production scalable, so we need a way to uh, improve this. Enter the procedural shipbuilder. So, shout out to the super smart guys of Samo and Francois and their whole team working on this uh, amazing, powerful, almost magic tool um, with Houdini. So, with uh, the procedural shipbuilder, we have way faster iteration iteration times, which allows for more experimentation artistically. And I think most importantly, there's no bottleneck on the designers. If they wanted to test a new camera, a new ship size, a, a new weapon, um, they don't have to wait for art. They can create their own to the, the, the specifications they need, and then we can produce the art to match that. It's pretty cool. So how does it work? Uh, very high level on this. So first we need to break up the ship into modular pieces. We started with the mast and the rigging first. Um, those are the most expensive. That's all the ropes and all the, the sails and stuff. So we break it up into modular Lego pieces. And then we organize it into a nested structure. So we have multiple mass, and each mast has multiple sections. Each section has multiple sails, and each sail has all the properties to sail with other sails, etc. So we put that into a structure. And then we generate the base minimal skeleton geometry. And then we store all the uh, inherited attributes with that. And then Houdini will construct the production geometry um, with those modular pieces. So yeah. Pretty, pretty fantastic. I got a video showing uh, a little bit of this in action.
uh, generated the, uh, the the production geometry. All that's left is to uh, do the cost animation. So we'll take the sails and we'll distribute them to a simulation farm, and then after that, the ship is ready to set sail. Pun intended. So it's looking pretty cool, but uh, not quite ready um, to put in the hands of the artists yet. Currently, there's about 500 to 1,000 um, parameters involved with this tool. Obviously, that's a nightmare for anyone, so we need to um, <clears throat> come up with an artist-friendly UI and give them all the buttons they need um, to make their lives easier. After that, we hope to expand this to other areas of the ship, like the hull, for example, uh, so we can make a complete ship procedurally. And then, if we're thinking uh, longer term, uh, it would be fantastic if we could uh, feed in a 2D image of a, a blueprint or a concept art and auto-generate the ship based on that. I mean, that sounds uh, borderline magic, um, but um, if anyone can do it, uh, I believe in our team, it would be pretty fantastic. So again, Osama Francois, amazing job on this stuff, and all the other talented tech artists and animators that help support this one. Uh, it's really going to be awesome when we can uh, make ships this way. And that's it. Um, thanks for taking the time to uh, check out some of the awesome stuff coming out of uh, my studio over here at Ubisoft Singapore. Uh, it's been a pleasure to share um, this amazing work. Thank you.